At the end of chapter 2 in the book of Daniel, we left an overwhelmingly impressed King Nebuchadnezzar by Daniel's wisdom, and we saw him actually making a confession of faith. Of a truth, your God is a God of gods and Lord of kings who reveals mysteries, for thou hast been able to reveal this mystery of the statue with a golden head. Now, 18 years later, according to Septuagint, this monarch wished to thank his favorite god Marduk. He seems like he forgot all about the greatness of Daniel, and he wishes to thank his favorite god Marduk, who happens to be the patron of Babylon. So he used a huge quantity of gold, the gold that he plundered from all the neighboring nations, which he subdued during his military operations. And he constructed a huge gold statue about 90 feet tall and about 10 feet wide. And all this with the highest grade of gold. Now let's read the text in the beginning of chapter 3. In his 18th year, Nebuchadnezzar the king made a golden image. Its height was 60 cubits, its breadth 6 cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And he sent forth to gather the governors and the captains and the heads of provinces, chiefs and princes, and those who were in authority, and all the rulers of districts to come to the dedication of the image. Interestingly enough, Herodotus, the historian, the Greek historian, writes about a gold statue of mythical worth, about 800 talents. Now, I'm not sure if this was the same statue here in chapter 3 of Daniel. But why pure gold and why all this expense? It seems that Nebuchadnezzar, was very much impressed about the vision and him being the golden head of that very high and grotesque statue that he saw 18 years before. He was already an egomaniac to begin with, but now after Daniel told him that he was the golden king, the golden head, it seems that this may have escalated his uh, egotism even more. So, this pushed him to construct such a multi-billion dollar statue by today's standards. So he erected this great golden image outside of Babylon in the plain of Dura, and then he commanded all his subjects, thousands of people from all over the neighbor nations, and there's an interesting statement here, all peoples, nations, and languages to come and worship at the feet of this golden image, the work of the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, this would honor the God of the king, but at the same time, it would also glorify the owner or the erector of this magnificent statue, His Highness King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the great colossus of Rhodes was only 70 feet tall, and here, Nebuchadnezzar surpasses that height. His statue is at least 90 feet high. Incidentally, these are not stories to make our day a little bit more interesting. These are realities and prefigurements of events that we ourselves may have to face. The statement, you are commanded or people's nation and languages, these are words that we find in the book of the Revelation around the topic of the mark of the beast. And this golden image that needed to be worshipped if one wished to live is a prefigurement of the Antichrist and his totalitarian regime, perfectly served and prefigured by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, 2,600 years ago. Not to mention that the very dimensions of this statue was 60 cubits and 6 cubits, so the number 66 six here is prevalent, and number 6 is the number of a man as opposed to number 7, which is a perfect number or a holy number. And I think this may have something to do with the 666 number, which would be the number of the beast, the number of the name of the beast 
in the final days. Now, outside of the fact that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to glorify himself by all this, the purpose was also to create a religious unity. At the dedication ceremony of this image, he was to invite all the satraps, all the officials, all the governors, the representatives of all his subservient states, all his taxed satellite nations, to come and worship his God. Now, he did not try to abolish the gods of his conquered nations. The Assyrians could have their own gods, the Medes, the Persians. Uh, they could all hold on to their own beliefs. But along with their gods, they needed to include his god, Marduk. This very principle was practiced by New Babylon, Rome as well, 70, seven centuries later, which also practiced pantheism. Now, this may help us understand why Christians were uh, such misfits in Roman society. They didn't belong. This was the accusation of the Roman masses. You don't belong. Because according to Cicero, it was Rome that chose which gods were valid or not. Your god needed to meet the approval of goddess Rome and or god Caesar. So you could worship Christ as much as you would like, but along with Christ, you also needed to worship Caesar once or twice a year. Then you could maintain your freedom, your property, and your lifestyle. By burning some incense to the altar of Caesar, you were free for the rest of the year. So some Christians, the Lapsi, bought this idea, and they were excommunicated by the Christian community. The church saw this as spiritual adultery, and rightly so, because there can only be one bridegroom for the Christian soul. What bridegroom would permit his beloved bride to have adulterous relations with another man once or twice a year? This would be inconceivable in a healthy marital relationship. The God of Israel, and now the same God of the new Israel, the church, does not do well with such relativisms Gnosticism, syncretisms, and ecumenisms. The treacherous idea that we don't need to have one specific faith, we can unite all the faiths, pick and choose what we like from each one, and we can enrich ourselves with each other's traditions, is the very basis of the worst heresy ever for the Christian church, the heresy of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is this philosophy called knowledge from the Greek, word, the Greek letter G, gnosis, which characterizes all the followers of Lucifer, including the modern-day Masons who are self-admitted Luciferians. The people of God use true knowledge and live by faith. They don't exclude knowledge, but they don't stop at the principal knowledge. Knowledge is a stepping stone to help us know the true God, our Creator, and develop a relationship of love with Him. So this mystery is not revealed to the clay-bound Christians who rationalize that all religions are divisive. So if we set aside our dogmatic differences and worship God under one roof, then we can enjoy years of peace. In the 70s, there was uh, much talk about building a temple to house all major religions, one house uh, of worship with four or five different wings, one for the Roman Catholics, one for the Protestants, Orthodox, the Jews, and the Muslims, all five religions under the same roof. The purpose? To enhance unity, understanding, and love between all peoples, to eliminate religious friction. This is the great delusion of false ecumenism propagated by Zionism. This is highly utopic because, if I remember correctly, Europe was predominantly Christian last century. Now, did the peoples of Europe enjoy peace and tranquility on account of their common Christian values and religion? I think not. World War I, World War II, the English against the Irish, the Greeks against the Bulgarians, the Serbs against the Croatians, they mutilated each other for decades and they were supposedly Christian. So a common religious ideology does not suffice to bring world peace. Only a decade ago, we saw 
are predominant Protestant and Papist uh, American nations using mostly Christian pilots to bomb our brothers in Serbia, killing thousands of innocent souls. On Eastern Sunday, they were dropping huge bombs on our brothers after they wrote on them, Happy Easter. False ecumenism is not the answer. The church is ecumenical. She embraces every human soul regardless of a national origin that wishes to enter through the mystery of repentance and regeneration. But as the pillar and foundation of the truth, she cannot violate her commission by accepting groups of people who do not wish to abandon their heretical beliefs. False ecumenism has now infected a great number of priests and bishops who never really tasted the spiritual fruit called true love. This is the highest fruit of the Holy Spirit, which does not come without asceticism, prayer, and fasting. In the absence of true spiritual love, people become enslaved to the whims of emotional, humanistic, and ecumenistic love purpose to help us live well upon this earth. So 600 years before Christ, Nebuchadnezzar wished to promote this type of religious ecumenism for the purpose of national unity by forcing the leaders of his subjugated kingdoms to share in his faith. He thought this would be a great way to cement his sovereignty. Once people embraced Marduk, then it would be very difficult for them to attack Babylon because they would have the wrath of her god. And it seems that history repeats itself because the great king Solomon attempted this very strategy. So, According to him, there's nothing new under the sun. Today's European Union started out 30, 40 years ago as an economic treaty. The purpose was to enhance the economies of the neighboring nations. That was the promise initially. 30, 40, 40 years later, it tells these nations what laws to have, what to believe. It imposes its polity on member nations, and it superimposes its ethics over and above the religious beliefs of each member nation. The demonic masterminds of the New World Order have succeeded in the removal of all Christian symbols from the public sector of all these Christian nations. The cross, the Ten Commandments, the Bible, and the Christmas tree have vanished from the streets, parks, and plazas of Christian nations, areas built and repaired and maintained by Christian tax dollars. The ACLU and its high-paid attorneys who litigated away all Christian symbols based on the lame excuse of separation of church and state have no problem with Talmudic rabbis erecting a 40-foot-high menorah at the lawn of the White House every December. And of course, these rabbis are accompanied by a prominent head of state, according to monk Brother Nathaniel, a rather interesting convert to orthodoxy from Judaism. Again, this is nothing new. It is not very different than the plan of Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, you can be a Jew, be a Christian, but don't need to be so absolute. Yes, believe in a higher power, but you don't need to be so dogmatic. Yes, go to church, go to the synagogue, but join the Masons, the Lions, the Rosicrucians, practice a little Hinduism or yoga. These are all expressions of the one God. But 2,600 years ago, three pious children, Uke Vimatosan, they did not go along with this mentality. These three glorious young men who inspire every hymnographer of our church, these three eternal youths inspired St. Basil, St. John the Chrysostom, St. Cosmas the Melodist, Rom Romanos the Melodist, St. Andrew of Crete. These three young people were anti communists They believed in absolute truth in an absolute God, because their spirit was imbued by the Holy Spirit of the Holy Trinity, the God of their fathers, who is a jealous God and does not unite with souls that flirt with idols and refuse to detach themselves from the pollution of this age. These three dynamic youths stood up to the most powerful men 
of the world under the worst possible conditions. Anyone who does not bow down to this statue will be cast into the burning fiery furnace that was right next to them. As the king's orchestra began to play with all these different instruments, thousands of people bowed down and only three young people stood tall. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah did not feel that it was harmless to worship at the feet of this golden image. Then came near certain Chaldeans and accused the Jews to the king, saying, O king, live forever. Thou, king, has made a decree that every man who shall hear the sound of the trumpet and pipe and harp and sackbut and psaltery and all kinds of music and shall not fall down and worship the golden image shall be cast into the burning fiery furnace. Well, guess what, O king? There are certain Jews whom thou hast appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Sedrach, Mesach, and Abednego, who have not obeyed thy decree, O king. They serve not thy gods and worship not the golden image which thou hast set up. After these three youths were brought in front of him, full of wrath, he asked them, and who's going to save you from me? What God can save you from my hands? Is it true that you serve not my gods and worship not the golden image which I have set up? Now I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to do this one more time for you. And if you don't obey, if you don't fall down, then you will be thrown in a furnace. And who's going to save you? What God is going to save you? The answer of the three youths is astounding. Your Majesty, if our God wants to save us, that's up to him. But if he wants to incinerate us because of the multitude of our sins, praise be his name. Nebuchadnezzar now is full of wrath. This is incredulous. You cannot believe this. He's furious. After all, he developed these young people in his own palace. He fed them from his own food, his own menu, his own wine. He educated them. He promoted them to governors. He gave them everything. How dare they to disobey him in front of his international staff? Nebuchadnezzar saw this as an unforgivable sin. Bind them up all together with strong ropes and throw them in a furnace. How quickly did he forget about the God of Daniel, who revealed those amazing dreams to him 18 years prior to this event. Again, the three youths were betrayed by their colleagues, perhaps the ones that helped save years ago with their prayers. Now, Daniel is not to be found anywhere in this chapter. He was probably away on kings on the king's business so he was not cast in a furnace but his envious colleagues will cast him into the uh, lion den years later saint john chrysostom the golden mouth of the church comments the anger of the king worked in the favor of the three youths by increasing the temperature sevenfold this is what the uh, the anger, Nebuchadnezzar said, you know, increase the fire, the, the temperature of the furnace, throw in more asphalt, throw in more tar and more petroleum and get the temperature as high as possible. That's what seven times means. So after this, by doing this, he was doing him a favor because he would be reducing their martyrdom. If he really wanted to torture them, he would have he would have them sizzle slowly with a slow fire. But now by making the furnace burn seven times higher, this would reduce their martyrdom to less than a minute or so. So they tied them up with ropes and they threw threw them in a furnace fully dressed. Nebuchadnezzar had asked them, and who is your God who will save you from my hands? Poor pitiful Nebuchadnezzar, the same God that made the oxygen that you breathe, the same God you fell down and worshipped 18 years ago, the same God who created all natural laws, the same God who created fire, the same God created all these things with his uncreated creational energy. 
the presence of his uncreated energy neutralizes all physical, biological, and chemical reactions. The uncreated light of God created a beautiful paradise, a space capsule around young Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The earthly fire burned what did not belong to them. It burned the ropes of the king. The heavenly fire protected every stitch of their clothing, even their Jewish caps. Who is as great a God as our God? Where God intervenes, when the kingdom of God manifests itself, all corruption ceases. Nature reverses and returns to its archetypal beauty. The kingdom of God, Christ himself, the angel of the Lord, appeared in the midst of the furnace, and the flames became incorrupt. The holy fire was soothing and exhilarating. The three youths were full of grace, and Azariah's fully inspired began to compose one of the greatest hymns of our church. Our church savors this hymn in the service of the first resurrection during the Matins of Holy Saturday, and we'll try to include it at the end of this talk. So the angel of the Lord, Christ before the incarnation, the Lord of glory, humbled the arrogance of the Chaldeans and their king. Our God is consuming fire, and he needed to empty himself. So natural creation would not be incinerated, according to St. Isaac the Syrian. This historical event that took place 26 centuries ago prefigures the mystery of God's incarnation. Just like the three youths and even their robes, their clothing did not burn in the same way the Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity, he would enter the universe he would be contained in a tiny place and space without burning and incinerating creation. The uncontainable logos of the Father would contain himself in the womb of the most holy Theotokos. All these mysteries are being prefigured here 2,600 years ago. This is the only thing new under the sun, according to Solomon. The three youths are also symbolic of the Holy Trinity according to the Katavasias of Pentecost. The gods of Nebuchadnezzar and the nations are powerless demons who sizzled at the presence of God's glory. But the angel of the Lord our God himself came to save his three most faithful servants. This prefigures how God the Logos will enter natural creation redeem it and save it just like it saved these three amazing and pious youths. The same mystery was made manifest on Mount Sinai when Moses beheld the burning bush. The angel of the Lord was the messenger of the great council, God's plan of redemption. The bush was the most holy Theotokos who stayed incorrupt by the fire of divinity. When and where God's glory manifests itself, it does so perfectly without change and without corruption. The clothing of the three youths remained unchanged, untouched. In the same way, the virginal membrane of the Most Holy Theotokos remained untouched. The body of St. Isaac of Shanghai in San Francisco is incorrupt because God's glory is overshadowing it. The Holy Spirit is permanently dwelling in it. God's presence brings paradise on earth with all its attributes. The holy fire of resurrection in Jerusalem does not burn in the first few minutes. And holy water stays indefinitely fresh. And according to the text, then those men were bound with their coats and caps and hose and were cast into the midst of the burning fire furnace for as much as the king's word prevailed. And the furnace was made exceedingly hot. Then these three men, Shadrach, Mizak, 
and Abednego fell bound into the midst of the burning furnace and walked in the midst of the flame, singing praise to God and blessing the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar heard them singing praises. And he wandered and rose up in haste and said to his nobles, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they said to the king, Yes, O king. And the king said, But I see four men loose and walking in the midst of the fire, and there has no harm, there is no harm happened to them. And the appearance of the fourth is like the Son of God. The appearance of the fourth is like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar, the impious monarch, saw Christ 2,600 years before the Incarnation. Then Nebuchadnezzar drew near to the door of the burning fire furnace and said, Sedrach, Mizak, and Abdenago, ye servants of the Most High God, proceed forth and come here. So Sedrach, Mizak, and Abdenago came forth out of the midst of the fire. Then were assembled the satraps and captains and heads of provinces and the royal princes, and they saw the men and perceived that the fire had not had power against their bodies, and the hair of their head was not burned, and their coats were not scorched, nor was the smell of fire upon them. And King Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Sedrach, Mesach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants because they trusted in him. And they have changed the king's word and delivered their bodies to be burned, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Wherefore, I publish a decree, Every people, tribe, or language that shall speak reproachfully against the God of Sadrach, Mizach, and Abednego shall be destroyed, and their houses shall be plundered, because there is no other God who shall be able to deliver thus. Then the king promoted Sadrach, Mizach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon and advanced them and gave them authority to rule over all the Jews who were in his kingdom. One thing that we see here is that Nebuchadnezzar is a lot more reasonable than the empire of clay that will come many years after him. Most of the Roman emperors who persecuted Christians, they would see miracles time after time again. They would see amazing things but they would not believe. Almost without fail, they would put the martyrs back in prison, behead them, even after they saw healing after healing. And this is a credit to Nebuchadnezzar, who hundreds of years before, he now humbles himself and bows down to the God of the three youths and the God of Daniel. And then he makes another confession of faith. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all nations, tribes, and tongues who dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It seemed good to me to declare to you the signs and wonders which the Most High God has wrought with me, how great and mighty they are. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his power to all generations. What a great mystery served by the glorious Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. It combines a number of mysteries. The mystery of the Incarnation, the mystery of the Holy Trinity, the mystery of the Theotokos, the mystery of the resurrection of the dead and the restoration of all things. Who is as great a God as the God of the Orthodox faith? a God whose eternal delight was to live with the sons of men. Amen. Hallelujah. Parla osa y felice maquilla.
Oh 